Today on City Cash Chicago, we're discussing an ethics probe in the mayor's re-election campaign, the opening of a controversial first responders training facility, and we got good news coming out of Wakanda. I'm joined by freelancer Siri Chilakuri and super producer Simone Alisea. It's Friday, January 27th. I'm Jacoby Cochran, and this is City Cash Chicago. Good morning, Siri. Welcome to CityCast. Thank you for having me. I feel really honored. I love this podcast so much. So love it. Like, great. It's great to be here. <laughs> hey, I appreciate you for saying that. And, and we're not even paying you to say it. Every single Friday, we like to look back on some stories that our guests were thinking about. What were they following this week? But we like to get started, you know, with a, with a nice look, a, a little cocktail question, a little chatter question. And this week is Chicago Restaurant Week, which is ongoing. We got the announcement of the James Beard Award semifinalist, which will be hosted in Chicago later this summer. Uh, but Siri, I had to ask you, um, what is a restaurant experience you recently had, whether they were recognized as a semifinalist or not, um, that you, you can't stop thinking about? This isn't super recent, but I did actually go to was one uh, one of the semifinalists and I had such a great time. The food was amazing. I went with some friends and uh, and actually the chef came out and talked to us. Uh, I really I love the food. I love the atmosphere, um, Zubair, like the the head chef, uh, is so nice. And, you know, I'm Indian, so I love some great Indian fusion food. Beautiful. Uh, Simone, I'm going to kick it to you. What is a recent restaurant experience that you had um, th- that you can't stop thinking about? Uh, a story that my mother can't stop telling. Uh, when she was <laughs> in town, uh, last time she was in town, I think this summer, um, we went to Second City for the first time and we ate at Gussie's Italian restaurant, which is across the street. My mother cannot stop talking about the table bread they serve <laughs> at Gussie's. The bread that comes onto the table. It's not just like your your normal, like, you know, white loaf. Like that's not what's happening. Mm-hmm. It is, it is some kind of enriched dough, like a brioche style kind of bread with ricotta that has been whipped with uh like roasted garlic and they've they've turned this into like this cheesy garlicky just beautifulness and they stuff the bread with that and then rebake it it is so good (laughs) my mother hasn't has uh enlisted my cousins into trying to recreate it at home (laughs) so that she can have it and my mother's coming into town next week and and i'm i will be shocked if she doesn't insist that we go there again (laughs) Okay. There are definitely some good, like, whipped ricotta dip recipes on TikTok, so. Oh, come on. I I like that. One of the restaurants nominated for Best New Restaurant is Obelique's in River North. It's like this French-inspired restaurant. I went there for a birthday celebration earlier this month. And while we got a bunch of things, one of the items that I really enjoyed was the Moroccan-style carrots. It's made with a little almond, some pomegranate, some lemon, some yogurt. it was tasty. Uh, it, and the fact that I had steak and what I'm still talking about all these weeks later is the carrots. I love that. Yeah. It, the good good lighting, like actual candles, not like just the, the sort of digital candles on the table. Um, and so between those three restaurants, I think we're giving people uh, some good options, some good choices uh, as they try and round out the rest of restaurant week. our producer Simone Alisea is going to sit in the chair as both Siri and I break down some of the stories we were thinking about. So take it away, Simone. Siri, let's start with you. Uh, We have talked a lot about the election. It's upcoming. There's a lot of information, everything coming out about our nine mayoral candidates. But uh, the incumbent, I know nine is a lot, the incumbent, Mary Laura Lightfoot, uh, in some hot water. Can you tell us kind of what what the latest is there? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Mayor Lightfoot's campaign, you know, is in some trouble because they were sending these emails to um, CPS employees and teachers um, about a program that, you know, um, involved CPS students where they could trade class credit for volunteering for the campaign. Um, And on Monday, uh, the Chicago Board of Ethics um, asked inspector generals for both the city and CPS. So those are two different departments to look into this to see if they violated a city ordinance. 
we broke this story down a couple of weeks ago when it first broke and there was a sense that there might be an ethics probe. But now that it looks like it's actually going to happen, uh, you sent me a link earlier today, Sue, because um, people have used Freedom of Information Act to get a hold of some of those emails. And, you know, the mayor first said, I don't know why this is such a big deal. People do this. And then eventually came out and said this was a problem uh, that was, you know, that took place with one of their staffers. But then you read some of these emails and it it ex- it like some of the teacher's response was the exact thing I expected. One teacher responded, thank you for your email. I find your candidate's values to be contrary to those that I attempt to inculcate in my classroom best. I was laughing at that for 15 minutes because we've spent a lot of time talking about the the back and forth between the Chicago Teachers Union and the mayor's office. And it's often been a contentious relationship. And so I always thought just sending this email out to maybe a random group of teachers was probably not going to have the returns you were expecting. But, you know, with the story they're giving, I'm not sure if the staffer was was really thinking about that context as they were sending it. But it seems like a a bad decision that is now only going to have maybe worse consequences. Yeah. And then, you know, she's uh, says that like she had no idea there was this overzealous staffer and it kind of raises questions of like your, your mayor and you're running a campaign to, you know, um, be in charge of the city. How, how is it that you're not in touch with your staff's own like media or, um, volunteer, you know, campaigns like that, that something like this wasn't, uh, something that you were aware of or vetting properly. I got to But, but here's, I got to say though, this is the second time we've talked about this on, on our show, the, this whole issue with the emails to CPS, but it didn't come up in the debates or the forums that have happened since, since this, this whole thing kind of unfolded. Um, you know, it's not like her challengers are using this against her. It's, I'm not seeing it in any TV ads. So, like, I got to ask, like, do we think this actually matters? Does it matter to voters? Does it matter to candidates? Do people actually care about, you know, this this potential ethics breach? I, I don't think people care, but I think that as Siri was saying, for me, it it forces you to ask other questions. Like, and if I was one of her... Um, you know, opponents, I would have been there on a debate floor. Like, you can't even promise students masks, but you want them to come work for your campaign. I would have been ready. I'd have had it loaded, ready to go. And so uh, I also wonder, did they not reach for that because they themselves looked at it and was like, oh, it's Chicago. I don't mean, would I have done that if I had all those emails in? I don't know if any of them probably could have answered like, no, I wouldn't have. And so I, I can't judge what their uh, intention was for not bringing that up. But we got a couple more mail forms and maybe they, you know, they didn't have it scripted. And I also think, you know, there's the like general barometer for what like an ethics violation looks like. And then there's the Chicago barometer. And I think a lot of Chicagoans are probably pretty jaded, you know, because every few years there there's some corruption case. So. So if it's not an indictable offense, maybe, maybe we, <laughs> we don't pay attention as much. Jacoby, uh, want to hear about the story you've brought for us today. Uh, we had an opening, a grand opening of a new training facility for first responders. This has been a long time in the making, highly controversial. Um, what is the, uh, the cop Academy as it's referred to? The cop Academy recently opened on the West side this week, and it's essentially a $170 million complex that will allow for police officers and firefighters to train on what they say are emerging new and everyday scenarios. Uh, This has been in the work for over five years, dating back to the previous administration with Rahm Emanuel being the first push. At the time, it cost uh, an estimated $95 million. And organizers and young people came out and said, in a city in which police in particular, but between police and firefight have budgets that, you know, go across the one billion dollar mark. Another hundred million dollar investment uh, maybe isn't the best way to use these resources. And at the time when Lori Lightfoot was running for office, agree with that and say yeah. that, you know, though police officers and firefighters, in her own words, deserve, you know, updated training facilities and, you know, quote unquote, the best resources that maybe putting a a training facility in an underserved community on the West side is out of touch. Uh, But then soon after being elected, sort of turned around and said, 
uh, that she supported investing and in fact gave more money to this project. And so throughout this, you know, five year stint, the, the No Cop Academy, which is a group of over 105 organizations, went out and did canvassing work and asked, well, what do people in Garfield Park want? in their community? What do they believe? And some of those numbers were very interesting. It was something like 70% of people weren't even aware it was happening during the time. Um, there was a good amount of people who believed that the money should be used elsewhere. Yeah. And, you know, kind of the, dis the discussion around the, the COP Academy and the No COP Academy, I think going forward, it'll be interesting to ask, like, what kind of exercises, you know, are they training to help someone who's you know, in, in crisis? Are they um, training to help people who are homeless access resources? Like, what are the trainings that they're doing um, and how would that impact people here in the city? And if I can add to that, just based on some of the stories we cover, will this, this training facility, this $170 million, 34-acre training facility, help police better meet their consent decree? Right. Which they are federally mandated to make changes. Will it help EMT and paramedics and the institutions that funnel them to communities? Will it help them respond to calls more effectively? City officials will tell you, yes, it will help with those things. Um, city officials will say this is how we meet those standards. In 2017, when Rahm Emanuel first was pushing this, and I didn't know this until I was reading up on it, it was in response to the part of one of the findings that that the Department of Justice put out was that cops were not well trained, that they were graduating without the right training. And so Rahm Emanuel was like, OK, well, let's give them the better training. And the police superintendent at the at the ribbon cutting this week said that this is how we're going to train cops to do things, quote unquote, the right way. You know, I think there are a lot of. Uh, reasons to be skeptical about any of those statements, but but the response, the 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 official response is that that's what this uh, mm -hmm. this training facility is going to to help do. Ooh, we made it to 2023, but does anybody else feel like you kind of just crashed into the end of the year, and now it feels like the sky's the limit for new beginnings? So, you already know what I'm going to say, right? Now is the time to listen to How to Buy a Home podcast. Buying your first home is a cool New Year's resolution, but it takes a lot of work and it's tough to know exactly where to start. So let host David Sedoni walk you through everything you need to know. Since 2005, he's helped plenty of listeners close on homes they thought were impossible, and he can even connect you to a realtor. Start planning today at howtobuyahome.com and make this the last year you rent. Find How to Buy a Home on YouTube and wherever you listen to podcasts. Every week we try to highlight some stories that maybe didn't get enough attention. Siri, you're bringing us a story uh, out of the CTA that's not about ghost buses, um, but something else entirely. Can you can you break down that story for us? Russia Brown is a trans former CTA employee. Um, and uh, in 2019, um, led like a successful push for the transit agency to add gender affirming care. And, um, you know, since all of that organizing that um, Brown led, he has since been fired. And now he's suing the CTA and the union alleging discrimination and retaliation on the basis of his being trans. You know, it brings up a lot of questions of like, what are the like real life impacts of discrimination? I think discrimination in some ways has um, turned into a buzzword, but there are real impacts on people's mental health, like on Russia Brown's mental health, on your ability to make a living, on your ability to, you know, live your life in your identity um, free from harassment. Trans rights are, you know, a hot button issue um, in, in several parts of the country. And so, I think it's important to remember that even in democratic strongholds, this type of discrimination can still happen and that we still have a long way to go before, uh, I guess, eradicating LGBTQ discrimination from the workplace. Yeah, it's worth noting, you know, in their legal responses to the to the lawsuit, the CTA and the union have basically kind of denied Brown's claims that, uh, you know, he was terminated because he was trans, um, you know the CTA saying that 
they terminated Brown um, for something related to uh, medical leave. Um, it, it was separate from his gender identity. Um, and you know, sort of that they didn't have enough information that they didn't they didn't know about allegations of uh, harassment from coworkers, uh, unfair discipline. That there wasn't enough information to 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 act on that. And so there's sort of a, a pretty broad denial um, that there's that there's wrongdoing here. But yeah, I agree. I think this will be interesting to watch. And it's especially interesting, I, I think, that this is happening at a public agency, uh, which is like that stuff we pay for and like stuff we're all kind of invested in. And so I think that that makes it worth watching as well. One thing we should really focus on uh, is. It's all. It's really difficult to prove you're being discriminated against in a workplace when it becomes your word against the word of, like you said, a public institution and managers and coworkers. And, and and so I think we need to be even more vigilant and not being dismissive. And especially because I think it's what, what's interesting to me from a labor perspective is that you know he uh, said that in his push to you know add gender affirming care to the um, you know, their existing healthcare plan that he essentially had to out himself. Right. Um, right. You know, to, to advocate on behalf of that. For sure. Um, we'll definitely keep an eye on that story. Um, Jacoby, uh, another story that uh, emerged this week of a tragic fire in Kenwood. Um, why is this something you want to shed some more light on uh, today? For a number of reasons. One, there have been multiple fires in my neighborhood. Over the last couple of weeks, whether it was, you know, further down on Kenwood, whether it was, you know, right here off of 51st uh, and Kimbark. And so for this week, actually during the ribbon cutting at that, uh, you know, first responders training facility, this fire was raging um, over here in this Kenwood high rise. Um, one person lost their life, nine other people injured. And as individuals started looking into the story, what they learned was this building had failed seven inspections as recently as December 22 related to fire preparedness and fire safety, whether it's uh, alarms or doing regular checkups. And that just reminded me of a story we covered almost two years ago in which the BGA um, found that the city's protocol for following up on landlords who fail multiple inspections is abhorrent that we do not pay attention to the the bad landlords list that we're supposed to have in this city that we put the priority or the responsibility on tenants to report things that are going on in their buildings you know and so that creates a system in which we're forced to hold them accountable and then hope that the city follows through it then makes you ask that question again, is this training academy while they were painting it as this, this is important. Look, right now, a fire is breaking out in a high rise on the south side. Our firefighters need more resources to learn, to prepare, to fight these. We like with everything, every problem is multi-layered. Sure, you can give them the tools to fight the fire, but are you putting enough resources in preventing these fires and holding landlords accountable, especially problematic landlords who, you know, violate inspections? Uh, and so I know our entire community over here in the Hyde Park and Kenwood area um, have, have really been thinking about that for, for the last few weeks of, man, are we being looked after? Are we being protected? You know, my heart is both with all of those families who've been impacted uh, while also trying to manage my own anxiety. I I totally hear that. It's worth checking out that investigation you mentioned from the Better Government Association and the Chicago Tribune. It won a Pulitzer Prize. Um, so it was, uh, it was a very big deal. Um, yeah, and just uh, really uh, uh, hearts go out to, to, to everyone, um, to everyone in the building and everyone in, in the neighborhood as well. Well, we don't like to end on uh, sour notes here at CityCast. We always like to leave the people with some good news to get them through. Jacoby's giving me a look because I didn't sing it. But Jacoby, I'm gonna I'm gonna just kick it to you first, so you can just you can just get it get us off here. Go 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 ahead. Go ahead and go ahead and uh, make it happen. Make do the magic. Some good news. Oh my God, he's showing off now. Oh my God. Because I wouldn't sing. He's showing off now. Yeah, Jacoby, you know, what's, your, 
<laughs> What's your good news this week? Uh, my some good news this week is in celebration of a guest we recently had and someone who I know is listening because they gave us a shout out, the homie Eve Ewing. I don't know if we close yes. enough for me to call you the homie, but we black. And so, you know, it's, it's dimensions to it. Uh, but recently, Eve Ewing was announced as being the next person to pick up the Black Panther series. She's going to be yes. the writer on the Black Panther relaunch. Now, a bunch of outlets have been wrongfully reporting that Eve Ewing is the first black woman uh, to helm the series but as eve points out from yona harvey to roxanne gay uh there have been other black women to write the series but as relaunching this having already done monica rambo having already done iron heart i'm excited to see uh what eve brings to the world of wakanda so congratulations to to eve ewing uh it's just another excuse to bring you back my g so i hope you're listening i agree i'm so happy eve ewing is such an incredible writer um, like you said, from poetry uh, um, to, you know, Ghosts in the Schoolyard. Yeah, it's always great when someone from Chicago is winning. Right? Basically. Yes. Yes. 100%. Uh, Siri, what's your uh, some good news uh, this this week? Yeah, my some good news is uh, from WBEZ. As uh, there are multiple book bans that go into effect, there are librarians in Lincolnwood and in Glenview who are trying to protect against um, bans of you know, LGBTQ materials in particular. And I think um, I think it's really important. You know, libraries for me have been such a such a safe space, um, even just having somewhere quiet to read a book. And I'm a huge book reader now. And I, I think it's important, you know, for kids of of all different um, types to, to have access to um, all different types of books. So um Yay for Chicago authors who who understand that value, and uh, yay for Chicago li- librarians who also understand protecting that that value. I love it. There were sixty seven attempts to ban books last year in Illinois, up thirty eight percent over twenty twenty one, and so. This is an ongoing challenge. The library is the best place to challenge that closed mindedness. So come on in here and, and expand yourself. Be better. Do better. One hundred percent. We love. Uh, we love. Just get get more information. That's what we do here at Citycast. In fact, we had an episode uh, about uh, sort of the growing book banning movement, and it has some really really useful tips. If you're in a community where you know this is an issue, or you know that this is this is coming up, we have some really useful tips for how to um, you know combat book bans. Basically, uh, really, we'll drop a link to that in the show notes. Uh, my some. Good news. That's, that's all I'm looking for. That's all I'm looking for. I know. Some that's all you want. News. Some I'm good for. news. Come on, Siri. Uh, I missed little, yours. Let me get yours my... real quick. Oh, my God. Some good news. Oh, my God. Ooh. Ooh, that was jazzy. I that's liked short, that. Sweet. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. What's your good uh, news, Baloney? My good news is I uh, am really excited to hear um, our audience is good news. Our, our listeners good news. So, right. We talk about this like every day, every week, we always could try to have an event, something that's going on in our lives that, that gave us joy. Um, something just like, you know, hearing about these librarians or hearing about Chicago authors who are doing good stuff. Um, and I feel like you out there, dear listener, have stuff that is just as good and we want to hear about it. So my good news is an anticipatory good news of (laughs) all of the voicemails we're going to get with the great stuff that's going on in your lives right now. What you can do is you can call 773-780-0246. Leave us a voicemail with your name, your neighborhood, and just what is the good news you want to share is it in your neighborhood? Is it in your life, in your home, uh, in the city of Chicago at large? Tell us, because I, I want to hear about it. I hear all the voicemails. I read all the texts. I have the tab open on my computer at all times. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I'm just excited for it. I'm excited to hear it. Come on. You heard her. She She's pleading with you. Send us <laughs> your some good news, and we will include it in the show. And trust us, uh, we we really like to hear from y'all. It really sustains us to to know you know, that people are listening and that they're responding. So please send those in. I want to give one more thanks to our producer, Simone Alisea, for moving us through this and our fantastic guest, the freelancer, Siri Chilakuri, for joining us. I appreciate y'all making CityCast that much doper today uh, than it was yesterday. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Jacoby. Thanks, 
Before I let you go, I want to give a huge thank you to the people who make City Cash Chicago and our daily newsletter, Hey Chicago. Shout out to lead producer Carrie Shepard, our producer Simone Alisea, our newsletter editor Sydney Madden. The music we love comes from all the kimonos, Mark Greenberg from the Mayfair Workshop, and Sam Thousand. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend, tell your family, you know, wherever you listen to us, give us a little five star rating, say something nice about us. Uh, we'll be back here on Monday morning with more news from around the city. I'll talk to you then. Peace. I was a, I, ain't gonna, I was a book thief. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I, I just forgot. It wasn't like I intentionally like stole the books. I wasn't trying to deprive other children. I just am a very forgetful person.